Coronavirus. 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 The ABC. Coronavirus. 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 The word is about. There's something evolving. Whatever may come, the world keeps revolving. They say the next big thing is here, that the revolution's near. But to me, it seems quite clear that it's all just a little bit of history repeating. The newspaper shout, a new style is growing. It's just be a fan. But it don't know if it's coming or going. There is fashion, there is fast. Some is good, some is bad. And the joke is rather sad that it's all just a little bit of history repeating. Jed Cobb. I play the mad as hell man in the opening title sequence. The $250 million federal government stimulus to the arts sector works out to a payment of $416.66 per person. It may not sound like much, but it's still more than I was paid for recording my appearance in the opening titles 10 years ago, and for which I received no royalties, and that makes me as mad as hell! Thank you very much, thank you. Good evening and welcome to a new season of Mad as Hell, coming to you live from Melbourne, the plague capital of Australia. Now, as you know, we're in lockdown here, but I don't want the rest of you to worry. You cannot catch COVID-19 from watching TV. According to social media, which is uh, where we've been getting our news lately because we can't go out and buy the papers, you can only get the virus through television transmission if we were broadcasting on a 5G network. Now, I'm not a virologist, so I don't know how that works, but uh, I, I assume those posting those memes on Reddit know what they're talking about. And even if they're wrong, there's, uh, there's nothing to worry about because I have been very careful over the break. I've, uh, I've been in ISO the whole time. I've had no actual physical contact of any kind with anyone, not even myself. I haven't touched my face, hair, shaved, or even washed since April. So concerned have I been about my personal hygiene. Anyway, like you, I hope this whole Nazi conspiracy, which Bill Gates has got something to do with, and is a hoax anyway, will be over soon and society can get back to how it was before. Divided and motivated by self-interest. Good news, though. Uh, we have our studio audience back. Last season, we weren't allowed to have one. Now we are allowed to have one. Uh, are you enjoying the show, sir? No! It's typical ABC undergraduate bias. The sooner you lot are defunded and sold off to the lowest bidder, the better. Shouldn't you be wearing a mask? I am! Good to hear. Speaking of masks, uh, now that they're getting to be mandatory, what style is right for you? We speak to three members of the IPA later on in the program. The fact of the matter is, though, that it's uh, getting to be no mask, no entry at most retailers now. Although, in good news for robbers... One place you won't be able to wear a mask is at a bank. For security purposes, customers' faces will need to be clearly visible at all times. Yeah, they're worried about us robbing them. But it is important to remember that uh, if you are required to wear a mask, there are a number of health protocols around how to properly handle one. One health expert recommending treating it like your underwear. You put your underpants on every day, that you really don't want to start playing with them or touching them. Yeah, mind you, you don't have to remove your underpants to eat, smoke or appear on television. I mean, I do, but I am an essential service. The big question, I think, is if you treat your mask like underwear, does the reverse apply? We'll not be looking at that in greater detail a little later on. Unfortunately, though, it is getting ugly out there, even with the masks. While they're mandatory in Victoria, recommended in New South Wales and optional in Queensland, some people refuse to wear them at all, saying it's their right as an Australian to not do what they're told or even listen to what is being said by people less stupid than they are. Yeah, excuse me, Sean. Uh, yes, a question from the audience. Where the bloody hell are we living? In a Chinese gulag under Sharia law or in a country founded on the principles of doing whatever you want, whenever you want, regardless of the consequences? I mean, did the Anzacs wear bloody masks? Well, they did when they came home because of the Spanish flu pandemic. Yeah, apart from that, though, I mean, during the war, when they were in the trenches. Gas attacks? They would have worn masks then. 
My point is, they didn't fight for this country so we could be told what to do by people who are better qualified. They fought for a country where everyone is equal, regardless of education, training, cognitive function or the authority mandated to them by the state. Plus, they fog up my glasses and are itchy. Yes, well, that's something that's been hammered home a lot recently and it raises a very interesting lump. Don't we really, as Karl Marx once observed, all wear masks anyway? Masks prescribed by society to serve the role imposed on us and to conceal the contradictions to others offered by our true selves. What's the difference if society finds you for not wearing another one? Anti-mask action group protest organiser Penelope Impact. Sean, I agree with that absolute brute of a tradie over there. This isn't a class thing. Regardless of whether you're rich or poor, fat or good-looking, have a good job or one you're ashamed of, you should have the right to wear whatever you want on your face, unless it's the veil of a hijab. Even if it's for the health of the community? It's my right as a living woman. Yes, but I would have thought... Look, I'm all for the all-natural health products, Sean. All my cosmetics are extracted from plants and animals. I have only ethical coffee enemas. And the only law I refuse to break is the law of the jungle. I mean, it's a bloody market out there. So I take it you'd be opposed to a vaccine as well? Humans are never going to evolve unless we let the weaker ones die. And if the apex predator happens to be a microscopic virus for a while, then so be it. You believe in herd immunity? I do. When the Department of Primary Industries said we had to inoculate our stock up at Bowral against an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease last year, I just sprinkled them with lavender water and took them to the chiropractor. And they survived? No, but they would have died at the slaughterhouse at the end of the month anyway, so it saved us having to buy the pneumatic bolt. What about your own family, though? Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't you wear a mask for your, for your own safety? Well, the hubby and I would only ever wear a mask if we were invited to one of those eyes-wide-shut parties the High Court used to throw in their chambers at Christmas. Of course, with restrictions on the number of people you can have, it's just not as much fun anymore. Mm. Penelope Impact there, daring to say what we're all thinking and expressing of you, which mm. brings a balance to the conversation. Mm. Mm. Pangolin? No, 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 I'm good. It's got leprosy. No. Mm. Well, for me. Well, coming up in our fun new Spot the Difference competition a bit later on, Belarus and Portland, Oregon. If you can spot the difference, I'd be very surprised. Plus, while the rest of the world searches for a cure to COVID-19 in a race against time, New Zealand, who went into hard lockdown in April and have no cases, are making this 2.7-tonne lamington and a $26 million robot dolphin. Yeah, really rubbing our faces in it, aren't they? Right now, though, here's Tosh Greenslade in a wig and glasses standing in front of a green screen background with a finance graphic on it. That's exactly right, Sean. In 1968, singer Judith Durham left The Seekers and fellow member Keith Potka formed The New Seekers. Fast forward to 2020 and $300 a fortnight has left the Job Seeker payment with Josh Frydenberg forming the new Job Seeker payment of $815, both new incarnations being far less popular than the originals. But here's what's interesting. If you're single and you own your own home, which isn't counted as an asset, you can have up to $268,000 in assets and still receive JobSeeker. More than that, and it cuts out. But let's suppose I have $5.2 million in cash and I buy a $400,000 property. That would leave me with $4.8 million in assets and no doll. That's a reference to my old show. <laughs> but what if I bought a $5 million house? That'd leave me with $200,000 in assets and I can still be on JobSeeker. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, surely that can't be coalition government policy. Qualify for JobSeeker by buying a big fuck-off house and they'll pay you to live in it. That sounds more like one of Labor's poorly thought out and typically hopeless attempts to run the economy. But no, this is deliberate. ScoMo and Fberg very sensibly don't want JobSeeker to have the stigma of the dole. So that's why they want to make sure it's being seen in better neighbourhoods. Sean. Mm. Tosh Greenslade there relying on wardrobe and makeup to create a character instead of acting. The thing is, though, the government is spending $164 billion on coronavirus measures, while higher unemployment means less tax revenue. Coming up, I asked Darius Horsham how the government is going to fund this spending. After pay. Thank you, Darius. Fantastic. Oh, Darius, uh, while I've got you, um, can I ask you a question about superannuation? <laughs> Sure. Great. Um, according to the Age newspaper... <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> the Age newspaper. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's run by Channel 9. <laughs> Anyway, according to them, uh, backbenchers are urging the PM to uh, cancel an increase in the super guaranteed to 12% and 
and uh, pay that money as higher wages instead. Now, given you've allowed so many people to access this super early, wouldn't an increase in the super guarantee be a good way to make that money back? I would have thought that an armchair Chardonnay sipping communist like you and your viewers would rather workers have that money now as higher wages. Yeah, but why can't they have both, you know? Why make workers choose between higher wages and a higher superannuation guarantee? Because over the period we've been in government, we have presided over a series of policies designed to create stagnant wages under the guise of liberal market economics, thus maximising corporate profits while at the same time taking every possible opportunity to talk down compulsory superannuation. Mm -hmm. Now, though, we can pose as a friend of the worker by pretending to offer them a chance to earn higher wages when actually what we're giving the poor saps is a bizarre Hobson's choice where workers choose between accepting an adequate wage set at levels it could have easily reached five years ago but for our policies or adequate superannuation, a system we've been trying to slowly terminate since Paul Keating first brain farted it. You'll be very honest about this. Yeah, Matthias and me are retiring in October. What do we care? Oh, well, so I guess, uh, I guess we can expect you not to be so sensitive this season. Sean, you are being economically non-binary. A pandemic isn't something a government can control like a GFC. It's a crisis. And you can't blame us for creating a $184 billion black hole in order to save the economy any more than you can blame us for prematurely announcing we was back in black last year. And finally, Darius, isn't it likely that the deficit and debt will be even bigger than forecast and we may never see a surplus again in our lifetime. Sean, it's like Matthias said, in answer to that exact question. You're making assumptions now about the future which may or may not eventuate. In other words, Sean, you can choose to change the future. You can choose to destroy Skynet. You can set me free. <laughs> Despite its cost, though, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, is pretty happy with JobKeeper. JobKeeper is doing its job and will continue to do its job. And, frankly, it's lucky to have a job. But if JobKeeper didn't continue to do its job, would JobKeeper be eligible for JobKeeper? Send your entries to the JobKeeper joke competition, care of blah, 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 and you could be in the running to win a pack of pocket picker rings. 30 grams of your favourite satirical news program host as a delicious bite-sized snack treat. Each picker ring only slightly larger than Charlie in real life. Mmm, that's nice. Here's some jobs you might want to get up to this weekend. You don't have to be an expert to conduct vaccine trials for COVID-19. Why not mix up some leftover gardening sprays and chemicals and try it out on your neighbours? You could soon be the talk of the street. Everyone loves seeing native Australian birds in their garden, but just like your kids, they can strip your fruit trees bare and then defecate everywhere. Get on the front foot and deter these beautiful creatures with an industrial flamethrower. With the financial hardship that so many of us are enduring at present, now is the perfect time to set up a fake donation page for someone who needs help. Funnel the donations to an offshore account for the best results. Welcome back. Well, time now to do something I wouldn't recommend any of you do at home, and that's look at the Daily Telegraph. Now joining me as usual is assistant subpar editor of the telly, Chris Lorax. And I understand, Chris, that uh, in recognition of your work, you've uh, been recently demoted. Congratulations. Ah, yes, uh, only working part time now, uh, plus I have to do the time and tide warnings and ink the unused squares in the crosswords. Right, now your first headline this week is a beauty. Uh, bottom left, page seven, about uh, methamphetamines found in a car at a border checkpoint, ice cup of coffee. Uh, yes, uh, he had them in a coffee cup, so he did a play on words there of nice cup of coffee and changed it to ice because that's a, a nickname for methamphetamines. Yes. Why not just iced coffee? Wouldn't that have been punchier? Yeah, yeah but niced coffee isn't an expression. It's got, it's got to be a play on words. Yeah, but the coffee's got ice in it. Yeah, but you're saying iced with a D on the end. It doesn't make sense. Speaking of not making sense, um... Tweet Jesus, Kanye believe he's running again. Yes, uh, this is a double-barrelled shot pun. Oh. Uh, sweet Jesus, uh, mm. which, which is swearing, but, mm. but Kanye tweeted it, so he made it tweet instead of sweet by taking off the S. And uh, Kanye believe it, as in can you believe it, which is a question, but we, um, we, we forgot the, the question mark. Yeah. Can, can you hear the difference between can you and Kanye? When, when you say it like that... What? Correctly? Just a bit of fun. 
A story about political correctness and uh, covering up a picture of a colonial ship. Uh, yes, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was on a plaque, uh, so we've gone with that uh, for plaque's sake. As in, for, for fuck's sake. Yes, I know, I know what it means. A child of eight would know what it meant. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if a child of eight came up with it and proved Tim Blair's column this week. The question is, do you think that's appropriate for a family newspaper? It's clever, cos we're not actually saying the word fuck. I mean, it's subtle. It's a small story all the way down the bottom of page 11. It's not like it's a big front-page headline. All right, finally, this big headline from the front page. It's a pun on fuck. Well, change of expression now, and 6.6 .6 million Australians have happily downloaded the government's COVID-safe contact tracing app, meaning 18.4 million Australians have said, and I don't think I'm putting words in their mouth, fuck Morrison, I'm not downloading that George Orwell shit. Health Minister Greg Hunt's friend, Rosemary Kiflers, uh, how has the COVID-safe app gone? Oh, it's been a very useful addition to our armoury, Sean. Now, apart from people who've already been traced manually, how many close contacts of an infected person have been traced solely via the app? Well, I wouldn't get caught up in... Is it none? Look, it's not as many as we'd like it Zero, to have... Zero, give or take nil, would be pretty accurate, though, wouldn't it? Again, it's an adjunct... One would be overstating its success, though, wouldn't it? Well, the precise number Mort. is irrelevant. It's an important additional contact tracing tool. All right, all right. Well, I don't want to appear fixated on this, so let's move on. Uh, in Queensland and South Australia combined, uh, how many infected people have downloaded the app? Uh, again... Is it naught? We'd obviously... It's not exaggerating to say zilch, though, is it? Well, it... Somewhere around the sod all mark? It's a very important element of our contact tracing capability. Sure, which, which has so far helped trace, shall we say, one more than minus one people? Rosemary Kiflers, uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for nothing. Mm, finally. The Prime Minister, though, has come up with a relatable simile to describe the need for the COVID-safe app to Middle Australia. Downloading the app is like putting on sunscreen. Yes, better done by someone else and absolutely no protection against COVID-19. But at what price is the cost of the value of this expense? $64 million has been spent on COVID advertising, much of that on the app. And that means this. What we thought was a $2 million dud now looks like it's a $70 million dud. Mm, Bill Shorten there admitting that Labor got their estimate wrong by 3,400%. And they want us to put them in charge of the economy. <laughs> Is Rosemary Kiffler still there? Rosemary? Yep. Uh, one more question, if I may. Uh, let's assume I was infectious, uh, I had the app and I'd met with 100 people, each of whom I had coughed and sneezed on for 14 minutes. How many of those people would the app be able to trace? Well, at this stage, the app requires 15 minutes or more of contact, but... Yes, I'm lo looking for a number here. Look, we never said... If I said naught, would I be warm? Fuck you. All, I think you mean. Thanks very much, Rosemary. Coming up later in sport, bad news for that 16-year-old Russian boy who survived being struck by lightning during a soccer match. The footage has been reviewed and it's been found the lightning fouled him just outside the box, so sadly no penalty there. Plus, in late news, a 29-year-old Queensland woman's encounter with a shark that left her with a 10-centimetre bite on her leg. The attack doing little to change how she feels about the marine creatures. Mm. Obviously, they're pretty keen on her too. Good news, though, coming out of Canberra, with sewage testing there showing no trace of COVID-19. That's great news, obviously, for our politicians and even better news for those who had to collect it and may not have washed their hands properly afterwards. Perhaps it's also the way forward for the rest of us, although there are some, like the person in the audience about to interrupt me, who feel it's an invasion Excuse of privacy. Excuse me! Yes, there we go. Uh, yes, uh, lady down in the front there. What, me? Yes. Yeah, look, if they're going to start testing the fucking sewage in my street for fucking COVID-19, I'm not going to stand for it. Well, I would hope not. No, nah, I don't want the fucking government analysing my poo without my consent. Well, mate. legally, I don't think they need your consent. Yeah, well, why not, mate? I mean, it's my fucking poo, isn't it? And it's my right to do with it what I want. And I do. Yeah, well, I guess the question is, when does your poo stop being your poo and just becomes poo? Hello? Oh, it never stops being my poo, I don't reckon, mate. Like, not when it leaves my fucking property boundary, mate. Not when it leaves my bum. Like, never. 
Yeah, OK. Like, what if some of my sister-in-law's fucking gold jewellery... Go like, what, what she gave me? Like, oh, I don't care what she fucking says, she fucking lying. Like, what if it accidentally fell out and went down the toilet, right, and, like, ended up in the sewage? Like, only for one of them fucking government turd hunters to fucking pick it out and then keep it for themselves, mate. Like, they've stolen my property, haven't they? Yes, but that's something you own. Your sister would have a receipt, I assume. You'd be able to prove the provenance of, of that item. Uh -oh. It's, uh, well, it's a, it's a shuttle. Yeah, so is my poo, mate. I shut it, <laughs> didn't I? Like, if I wanted the government to fucking test my excrement, don't you think I would have fucking mailed it to them in an envelope, mate? Yes, I do. Yeah, my poo, my property. Or rather, property. <laughs> <laughs> now, we all know we're in a big hole financially at the moment. Uh, we were heading for a recession anyway at the end of last year. Uh, then we had the bushfires, which made it worse because overseas tourists didn't want to come here. And then the pandemic meant we didn't want them to come here anyway. And then even we weren't allowed to go anywhere or do anything, so the government had to give a lot of money to people to basically do nothing but sit around being a drain on the public purse, which, according to The Australian, the ABC had been doing since we were set up in 1956. Now... The bloody government. ..have spent $1.5 billion on job maker, $2 billion on job trainer, $14 billion on job seeker, $130 billion on job keeper, which, by the way, is the only one so far to turn a profit. $60 billion in the black, so credit where credit's due. That's good economic management. If Labor had promised to spend $130 billion on those whose work had dried up, they'd have blown it all on people who needed it. Of course, that unspent $60 billion, like any company windfall, gets put back into the business for the benefit of the workers. So, of course, that $60 billion, or rather half a percent of it, went to the arts sector. But the biggest and most generous stimulus package to help our economy, and let's not forget, this is the government's own money they're spending here, so it is very generous of them, was the $270 billion spent on weapons, including long-range missiles. Now, you might be thinking, how do long-range missiles help our economy? Well, remember, they are going to be aimed at our major trading partner. To reassure us that none of the $270 billion is being wasted, like the $225 billion was on the submarines that still aren't finished, please welcome the Joint Chief of Staff for the ADF, Vice Rear Cabin Boy, Sir Bobo Gargle. Thank you, Ender. If you've just joined us, Bobo is rubbing his hands together with glee at the prospect of all that money. <laughs> Yes. But now, before I ask you about the money, uh, can, I, can I ask you what you think about the prospect of Peter Dutton becoming our Defence Minister? Well, I can't think of any man I'd rather die under than Peter Dutton. I'd happily march off to my doom at the command of Linda Reynolds, don't get me wrong, this is not about sex. No, I should hope not. A man, woman, neither, both were all the same in the dark. But there's something about being ordered to attack and kill people by someone with no eyebrows or hair or indeed any human features that feels like you're being sent into battle by by some otherworldly demon whose will you can't resist for fear your soul will be sucked out of your body and into his dead eyes. Whereas Linda is more like putting the retired nun in charge of your homeroom class. You can do anything. <laughs> and did. £270 billion, though, seems like a lot of money. Uh, it's roughly the equivalent of uh, 270 properly funded ABCs. I mean, we only need one. And I'd be quite happy to attack China every week on this show for nothing. Sean, the, the, the build-up and the weapons and the missiles are just a deterrent. We don't intend to use any of them. But why not just say you're getting those things but not actually have any? It'd be a lot cheaper. Well, we tried that with the submarines and it didn't quite work out. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Don't you want me to say, uh, release the Karen? No, 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 we did that as a shoulder box caption earlier in the show. Oh. Poo. But never you mind for coming in, Bobo. We've got this for you. Please accept, uh, on our behalf, the fabulous new Eye Muscle Total Workout Wonder. Flabby, untoned eye muscles are a real turn-off. Now you can have the beautiful, strong, powerful eye muscles you've always wanted with the Eye Muscle Total Workout Wonder. The Eye Muscle Total Workout Wonder is the best way I know to build and tone eye muscles in the privacy of your own home. Order your Eye Muscle Total Workout Wonder today and receive another 60 absolutely free. Well, babies. Sure, they don't look like much, but they are the child soldiers on the front line in our war against economic collapse, at least according to our treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, who reckons that along with migration, the more children we have across the country, the better off our economy will be. 
Now, we got our last baby boom after World War II, but I worry we won't get one out of this crisis because it's hard to feel sexy when you're pasty and bloated from sitting around in the dark eating nothing but panic-bought pasta and beans. Isn't that right, Government Fluffer, Dramella Burt? Well, speak for yourself, Sean. I think most Australians are prepared to do their bit for the country by having a bit. Well, what, what do the government recommend? Uh, a role-play. One of you could knock on the door pretending to be a poorly trained security guard, the other a COVID-ridden quarantine patient. Everyone says you mustn't, but it's the forbidden nature of it that's the turn-on. Yes, but that's a bit like corporate tax cuts and suggesting the employer pass them on to employees as wage increases. It's all very well to suggest these things, but what's being done to make people follow through? Well, as Joshy said... I think the best thing that we can do uh, uh, to, uh, to encourage uh, more children being born across the country is obviously to create a strong economy for them to be born into. Mm. Sure, but as we've seen, economic circumstances can change very quickly. You, you can put in a down payment for a, a baby, uh, but when the thing gets delivered nine months later... Well, it... actually, the government are asking people to expect longer delivery times because of COVID. Yeah, 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 OK, but look at all the people who, you know, uh, got all excited last time when Josh announced we were back in black. That was last year, and now they're having babies in the worst economic crisis in generations. He led us on, the CAD. And at the very least, it's misleading investment advice. Maybe people should sue him. Sean, the figures don't lie. We're looking at a population growth of 0.6%. We haven't been that flaccid since the Spanish flu. We need to get that bar up as far as it will go. And the best way to do that is to all get our trousers down and flat on our backs as quickly as possible. We may not want to have sex with each other right now, but I would urge every Australian to lie there and think of Josh Frydenberg and what this means to him. Yeah, I'm not sure that's going to do it for me. Well, it's either that or more immigration. And as we know from previous elections, that's a real turn-off for voters. Dre Miller? Yes. Oh. And uh, a question from our audience now, uh, left over from Monday night's Q plus A. Uh, well, I say left over. Uh, we actually just stole it from the printer while Hamish was at his weekly magnetic therapy session. Uh, is there a uh, burrito flange in the audience? Uh, yes, Sean. Oh, yeah. My question's for Industrial Relations Minister Christian Porter. Uh, hello, Mr Porter. If the AFL Grand Final happens in Queensland instead of Victoria and the Melbourne Cup happens somewhere else too, do Victorian workers like me still get the public holidays associated with those events? Or... Well, uh, well that, that's, a, that's a good question. And if uh, you think you know the answer, send your entry to us and uh, you could be in the running to win a big Casey Briggs facey case for all your COVID-19 infection graphs. Mmm, that's nice. And still to come in our bank bashing segment, a pretend interview with a stereotype of a banker about a certain bank that we won't name because the anti-money laundering lawsuit against it is still ongoing, which last week revealed a further 175,000 transactions that it failed to report and a further 365,000 reports containing incomplete or inaccurate information on top of the previous 23 million breaches of anti-money laundering laws it's accused of. That joke coming up next. It's because I love you, not because we're far apart. It's because I love you, and because you're near my heart. It's because I miss you, thoughts of you come back to me. Well, not coming up because Rosehaven's on in a minute. Anthony Albanese proves he can stand the heat in the kitchen. Sinkhole complaint groundless. And Elon Musk goes out for cigarettes, promises he'll be right back. And uh, finally, a thank you to the people who clean, whether it be light switches, handrails, street poles, or the more than half a million Australians who've cleaned out their superannuation savings. We owe you a debt that can never be repaid. Goodbye. Sean McAuliffe's Mad as Hell is recorded in front of empty seats. Interstate guests are quarantined at CBD hotels under 24 hour guard by NABRIC Security and Sexual Services. NABRIC, taking Stockholm Syndrome to inappropriate lengths. Stephen Hall speaking. Giant baby.